here. All right, so like I said, we're going to go through the wheelchair comp today. I'm going to go through the step-by-step -step how we do the wheelchair comp. Each wheelchair comp is going to have a scenario. So your scenario might have a patient that's a stroke. Your scenario might have a patient that is a hip fracture where they had hip replacement. Your scenario might be a scenario where the patient had total knee replacement. In those cases, for most of the cases, again, we're designing a wheelchair that's going to be a long-term use for them, right? You're not going to have to measure all the specific special measurements like, you know, head measurements. You're not measuring them from a headrest. You're just going to measure your general measurements, right? So for the most part, what you're measuring for, obviously, leg length, right, or seat height, seat depth, seat width, right, back height, armrest height. So we're going to go through all of those measurements. You're going to have to demonstrate all of those measurements. Then you're going to have to show your person the parts of the wheelchair. So you're going to break down and kind of go through the parts of the wheelchair, show them how the armrests come off. If it has footrest, put the footrest on. I should have grabbed some footrest earlier, but it'll be fine. We're just going to pretend like I have them. And then you're going to show them how to open and close the wheelchair, so how to collapse it, how to take it open again. Then you're going to get in the wheelchair and do what? Show them how to move it, right? Part of the comp is going out and using the ramp outside. I am still awaiting permission from the um, property owner. He did not seem very thrilled about letting you guys go outside and use the ramps. Um, the guy next door already kind of got upset that we went down there and had one wheelchair on the ramps that was interrupting his business. So like, I don't know about you guys, I didn't see many people bothering us, but whatever. The guy that was talking to me behind him seems to He was interested in it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he was actually, he was, he was like, I want to learn more about my wheelchair. Um, but yeah, so, you know, probably not going to have to demonstrate going up and down a ramp. It'll be a good idea to talk to patients about that at least, right? Even in the hospital, you may not have a ramp to go up and down, right? I would really love to go over to the Clark County School District building because amazingly enough, over there, there's an actual ADA wheelchair ramp, which is the right height, the right length, the right width. It's perfect, but they said no. So I tried, uh, Well, the, the, but it is their main employee entrance. So I understand if we had a bunch of people going up and down the wheelchair and kind of getting their way, right? Um, and they got important Clark County School District stuff to do. So can't interrupt that. So we're gonna go through that. I'm gonna bring somebody up. We're gonna demo, kind of start to finish what the wheelchair comp is gonna look like. And then I'll take some questions and then you'll practice. Um, there are a couple of you that have comps to make up. You may have the uh, transfers comp to makeups. Uh, I know at least one or two of you have glove gown and mask to make up with me. And then there's at least one other one I think that needs to be made up with some of you. Oh, um, vital signs. So a couple of you have that. Well, I'm going to use Dr. Arada kind of or my makeup comp person. So once we kind of get practicing, I'll float around and answer questions about the wheelchairs. And as you're ready to go get comped, she'll check you off on your comps for those comps. That kind of keeps one of us kind of floating and then also one of us getting rid of the, the back comps. Those all have, if, if the comps aren't done, I can't pass you in the semester. If I can't pass you in the semester, you can't go on to clinicals. Believe it or not, if you don't get the comps done, you can't do the practical. If you can't do the practical, well, you definitely fail. So we got to make sure we get all those comps done. Um, so there's a couple of you that have that. You, those of you that are here that know it, I'm not going to call you out. You know, Edwin, I wish you would do your, I'm joking. Edwin just did all this. I'm just an answer. Right? He's just an easy target. So let's go through the scenario. So what's going to happen for the comp? You're going to come up to one of us for your comp. You're going to be ready. You're going to have a partner. Now, you're not going to get the same scenario as your partner. That means your partner doesn't have to have comp before they did it. Because as soon as you draw that scenario, guess what? That comes out of the pile. They can't get the same one. Right? Because that way it's even. You don't have to be worried about doing it with a different person. I should probably stand in the camera so they can see what I'm doing. I'm not standing. My habit of walking around is now limited to here. Um, I need one of those tracking webcams is what I need, right? I have one of those at home. That's why I do it. Anyway. So you'll draw a scenario. That scenario will say, you know, you have your patient is a 63-year-old patient that had a right middle cerebral artery stroke and is now looking for a wheelchair for consistent mobility. Measure the patient for the wheelchair, explain the wheelchair, and dem have demonstrate them mobilizing the wheelchair, right? So let's just say we had that stroke patient as an example. What are some thoughts going through your head? Is he flaccid? 
probably going to be flaccid on one side. Good, right? You figure out that they flaccid upper extremity, lower extremity, or both, right? And it'll save the scenario. So don't totally freak out. You don't have to kind of go, oh, God, I got to go look this up. It'll save the scenario, right? So you think about the flaccidity. What else do you have to worry about? Which side's affected, right? You know, it's a right MCA that tells you the part of the brain. So that means left side affected, right? So you have to kind of think a little bit through that. It's not going to tell you your left side is, but it'll say upper extremity more flaccid than lower, or lower extremity more flaccid than upper, or bilateral flaccid. Not bilateral, but uh, unilaterally flaccid. So everything's flaccid over here. It'll cover something to that effect. Does that make sense? Your patient does not have to sit here and be like, right? In a real life, though, your patient will be doing that. So although this is a practice run at doing this, understand there's going to be more to measuring than just what you're doing, right? You're, we're going to effectively say that your patient has good sitting balance, actually fair sitting balance. That means they can have both hands on the mat and sit up okay, right? So you're going to have your patient sit at the edge of the mat, and then you're going to do the measurements, right? Their feet should be where? On the ground. Yeah, mine are dangling. So our feet should be down on the ground so you can get the measurements, right? What are some other things you might ask your patient before you start taking measurements? Okay. Medications, right? You might want that. That'd be good for your soap nut. Then I heard shoes. Are you going to be wearing shoes on a regular basis? If so, are these the normal shoes you're going to be wearing? Because what if, you know, today I'm wearing these, but I'm going to be wearing Timberlands, right? That might actually affect measurements a little bit, right? Or, you know, maybe I'm going to wear a set of chucks. And those chucks definitely have a smaller heel. So you have to kind of take that into account. And if they say, well, no, I don't have those shoes with me. Well, the measure and get kind of go off what you got. But for the most part, your patient's going to say, yes, these are shoes I'm going to wear. What else might you want to know about what they're going to wear? Clothing, right? Is this what you normally wear on a daily basis? No, this is only what I wear at a lab. I'm just joking. See, because it'd be you guys, right? Ah, I'm so funny, right? And we're going to assume that it is. Okay, so you get that. What other kind of anthropometric measurements do you need to get from the patient? What's AP measurements mean again? They're human measurements, anthropometric, right? So what human measurements do you have to get from them? Weight. Height and weight. There we go. Good. I heard them. Height and weight. So you come up to the patient and say, you know, about how tall are you? And then about how much do you weigh? Right? They don't have to be exact. Ideally, if you were in a, in a truly measuring clinic, you'd want to take them over the scale and weigh them and get the correct height, right? But if I'm like a flaccid stroke patient that can't stand, not going to go well sitting over there. Now, most places that have hospital beds, where's the scale at? The end of the bed, right? You can use it now 90% of the time, and I'm sure those of you that work in hospitals say they don't work. They work kind of, sort of, maybe. At least it gives you a good idea how much the patient weighs, but it's not perfect, right? So you may have to look at that. How could you get their height if they didn't know their approximate height? You could measure them, right? You could just have them lay down, take out a tape measure, and go from head to foot and measure them, couldn't you? Could I get it and seat it here? Sure, right? I can measure my, my leg rest height, right? Depth, and then measure from here to my head. And would I have all the measurements I need to estimate their height? Yeah, is it gonna be perfect? No. Right, you know, it's gonna be like, well, I measured you five four, and you're actually five three, close enough. Right, you're not gonna get like measuring this, and they're seven feet, and they're actually only four foot two. If you do, you need to learn how to use tape measure. I'm just saying, right? For most clinics, again, until we kind of adapt out of America, we do measure in inches for these because wheelchairs are all set up. All the sizes are set up in inches. If you go over to Europe, though, again, guess what? Now everything's in centimeters, you don't have to adapt, right? So just be aware of that. But here, we're Marka, so we measure in freedom units, right? So we measure in inches and pounds and all that fun stuff. Is there anything else you can think of from the patient you might want information-wise? Okay, if they had any other surgeries, good. Well, you may have to add a few inch, an inch or two. Or have them wear that one day. Have them bring it with them. Mm -hmm. That definitely would affect things, yeah. You, you saw this Christmas story, right? So if you have a snowsuit on, I can't move! They may not be able to wheelchair either. Right? But yeah, you may have to adjust for that, right? Or, you know, I don't know, maybe we're in 
Trinidad and Tobago now, and everyone wears like just bikinis all year round. That wouldn't be a good fun thing, right? To get some nasty seat burns from that. But yeah, you'd have to take some stuff into account. Just ask them, right? And if that's the case, well, we may take some general measurements and then have them come back with all of their gear. You know, let's just call it that, and then remeasure them, right? Or if they're like wearing a parka normally, right? They may not wear a full ski suit, but they might wear a big, heavy parka normally when they're outside. The other thing is, in a place that snows a lot or is very rural, the tires are going to be different on the wheelchair, aren't they? Yeah, they're going to be more kind of off-roady tires. Because these tires, you put, you go out here right now where it's raining and snowing, and guess what? You ain't going anywhere. You spin around in a circle, <laughs> right? So sometimes we have to make those adjustments. I've had patients, especially like that live out towards like Lake Las Vegas, or rural Henderson where everything's dirt. And these wheelchairs don't get around their driveways and stuff like that. They need a little bit of knobby tires to get around, right? So we may take that in consideration too, but sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, nope, question? Did I just try your question? You wanna think about it a little bit and come back to it? Okay. Um, so yeah, you might have to, there might be some suggestions you might have to make to the wheelchair company saying, hey, this patient has a dirt driveway, can we get adaptable tires or something like that, right? Or, or it's available. And the patient may not be able to afford it, so they may have to get whatever wheels they've got, right? So again, that cost fallacy is going to come in there to figure out how much they can afford. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense though? And all that's going to come on the back end. Once you kind of get all your measurements, that's when you're going to talk to the wheelchair manufacturer and say, hey, Here's all the stuff they have. This is what I need. What do you got for me? Right? Now, is it possible you measure the patient and a standard wheelchair would work? Yeah. It's completely possible that you're like, okay, height, weight, all this. And you're like, oh, well, you'd fit a standard wheelchair. Is there any sense in ordering a custom wheelchair at that point? No, all that is the what? Extra cost, right? You might as well just get them an off the shelf or, you know, tell them, hey, can you look into getting, <clears throat> excuse me, a used wheelchair for now, because that way it saves their custom wheelchair for maybe down the line when they need one, right? It makes sense because you only get one. Sometimes you can get two if you're lucky with Medicare, but most times, sorry, you're going to get one and that's what you get. Yeah. Yeah, I would ask them. What, I, I mean, yeah, they could, but a lot of times we're, you know, that's going to come from family more than them especially if you're in the hospital setting, because you're going to be like, okay, you know, Gene had a stroke. You know, you're going to talk to the, so what's your wheelchair? What are your doorways? Like, so give an example, back when my wife was in a wheelchair, the doorways into my apartment were too narrow. I couldn't take the wheelchair inside, right? They were like, I'm, you know, I sometimes have to go in sideways. I'm so big. I'm just joking. Actually, I'm wide, but, but truthfully, like my, I'm not even joking. My doorways are only, I think, 26 inches wide or something like that. So they're really super narrow, right? If that happens, and what happened with, back when I had my wife, is what I had to do is I had to wheel the wheelchair up to the door, and I had a chair that I kept inside the door. I lifted her out of the wheelchair, carried her in the door, hopefully didn't bang her head as I went in, right? Took her to the chair inside, put her on that chair for now, collapsed the wheelchair, rolled the wheelchair in, and then opened the wheelchair and put her back in the wheelchair so she could move around the apartment. Ironically enough, all the apartment doors are fine. It's just the one getting in the house that was the problem. Except for the back bathroom. The back bathroom narrow too, but we have two bathrooms, I'm fine. But does that make sense? So yeah, you might have to. You might say, hey, can you take some measurements? You're right. We may want to see, are there counters accept accessible? Right? Can they actually get around with a wheelchair? Um, are there any dogs? Are there any pets? Right? What does the carpet look like? Right? Do they have like really, do you ever go to like one of those restaurants where you step on the carpet and you know that this is going to be an expensive experience? Or you step in that restaurant, your feet just go sink into the nice comfy carpet. You're like, I can't afford this place. Right? Maybe they have that at home. No one's ever done that? I've been to a couple restaurants like that before. I did that in Orlando. I went in for a steak place and I walked into the place and I'm like, I can't afford this place just by their carpet. Sure enough, I was right. I should have walked there. I got steak was 92 bucks. Anyway. Oh, God, one good steak, though. It was good. But yes, yeah, so you may have to talk to your patient about stuff like that. Right? Ask them what's going on. What, is, what are they living today? Do they have any help at home? Right? So they don't have help at home. Could they be stuck if once they're in their wheelchair? Yeah. What about in the bathrooms? What might you want to know for somebody that's in a wheelchair? Safety bars. Safety bars? Door, width. Door width, right? Toilet. Toilet height. How to get in and out of the shower? Do they have a shower with like standard sliding doors? Are they curtains? Right? 
Which do you think is going to be easier for somebody in a wheelchair? Curtains or sliding doors? Yeah, curtains are usually a little easier because they can kind of just, you can just reach up and kind of, right? You have a sliding door and you do that. I don't know if you, I, you guys ever do that, but if you do that too much to a sliding door, if you have a kid, what do they do? Bang, 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 right? They just close and open on you, right? And not only that, but if you have the curtain, it can open all the way in more access, right? You know, maybe they only have a tub at home, so they might also need a what? Shower chair, right? A mobility chair, right? But yeah, definitely we want the grab bars because they're going to need to know if they can do it, right? What's their toilet height look like, right? If their toilet height's really low, right? Um, like our toilets here, I, I hasten to believe those are handicapped accessible toilets. Because I feel like I like my knees are up in my chest if I have to sit on one of those toilets in there, right? Well, we've all been there, right? You go to like a restaurant or an uh, airport, and you go to the toilet, and you're looking down like, I am never getting back up from that thing, especially after leg day, right? So, you know, they may have to tell you a little bit about their home. We might have to get a toilet seat, right? Or a raised toilet razor, right? Um, we might have to get something that helps them get into bed too, right? Might we have to teach them a slide board transfer? Maybe, yeah, it might be beneficial, right? Might have to give them a lift, who knows? Any other questions on the general comp before I start going? Does that make sense? Okay. So I need a person. I promise you this is not going to hurt you in the least. You're just going to be the victim on camera. Who wants to be my victim on camera? Edwin, how'd you like to be the victim on camera? <laughs> Come on up. Hey, man, you got that charm, bro? That's what I say. He's got the charm for it, right? He looks like a movie star. So I'm going to have you sit, just sit on the edge of the mat. He's on the floor. Let's first, uh, yep, so he dangles a little bit. So I want to bring his feet down just a little bit. There, see, you're on camera. You're on candy cam. <laughs> So do we need to ask someone else questions? That's what I'm going to go. You don't have to sort of come through. But it may be something you want to do in the real world, right? There you go, Are the cohorts going to see this? Your cohort is. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you're fine. You're the future ones, right? I mean, not unless I'm like doing starring Edwin. Oh, cool. cool. All right. So what? how do we begin the comp? What do we do? Come in and introduce stuff, right? So I'm going to come in and say, Hey, Mr. Edwin, I'm Mr. McKeever. I'm going to be your physical therapist assistant. For you guys, you'd say you're the physical therapist assistant student, right? It's really important. Don't say PTA. Why? I don't know what it means, right? If you, oh, you're from the, the Parent Teacher Association? Come in to measure me? That doesn't make any sense, right? Make sure you kind of tell them I'm a physical therapist assistant. Uh, good job sorry, picking my sorry. table. I'm just messing. I have to edit that out. Um. But yeah, so I'm going to yeah, introduce myself. We're here to do what? What would you say? Wheelchair measurements and explain to you how to use a wheelchair. And then we say, is that okay? Can we do that today? That gives us what? What type of consent? In verbal informed consent, which I just remembered I forgot to put on that soap note, but it is up, by the way. So I gotta add, you should add verbal informed consent on your soap note, right? So yeah, page you gave verbal informed consent, or they say agreeable to treatment. That means they actually said something, right? That's usually what I use. So I got that. Now I need to probably assess if he has any what? Any deficits or any, what's the other word we like to use? Yeah, yeah. Any contra indications, right? So that would be where I ask him, do you have any of these following things? What would be some contra indications? Yeah, well, I can't say I'm not really worried about the wheelchair unless it's on his butt. Rotation. Any new fractures? Good. Have you fallen recently? Right. Um, do you have any blood clots? Because we're going to be moving around. Any new blood clots? Are there any? My main one I ask a lot in the hospital is: Are there any new doctor's orders I need to be aware of? Right. Maybe you got a doctor's order. He's not supposed to be out of bed. Well, then I shouldn't do what? Get him out of bed. Get him out of bed. Makes sense, right? Of course, he's saying no because he's the perfect patient, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I would, I mean, hopefully it's obvious to you, yes. right? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just that's what I say. Is there any new surgeries? That would be a good way of saying, oh, yeah, I got my leg lopped off. They'll tell you that then, right? Uh, hopefully you're not walking and go, okay, let's stand up. And the patient's like, really? I actually had that. One of the scenarios for one of the practicals, I remember which one it is. I think it might be next semester. It's a patient has bilateral amputations of the lower extremities. And obviously you guys can't fake that because I'm not going to chop your legs off. But every time I do that, at least someone says, okay, now you need to stand up. That's just cruel and unusual punishment to a patient, right? I don't have legs, but he's fine. He doesn't have amputations, right? Okay, so I've got consent. 
I check for a contraindications. That may be where I ask him, is there anything new I need to be aware about? He doesn't have anything new. So what do we start with? Well, we'd start with measuring for the wheelchair, right? And what do I need to measure for the wheelchair? Well, ideally, what you should have for measuring for the wheelchair is two yardsticks and a tape measure, right? You don't have to have the yardsticks, but what I find is I get more accurate measurements if I have the two yardsticks, right? You can go with just the tape measure, right? If, you, you know, if you're at the patient's home, you don't carry two yardsticks with you, tape measure's still fine. I am old school. I prefer one of these tape measures because I break all the other ones, right? So I like the, the standard kind of tapey tape measure, but any of the tape measures work, right? So then I have to ask him, are those the shoes you would normally wear on a daily basis? Great. Yes. Is that clothing kind of generally what you wear during the day? Yes. Okay. Just making sure. So I'm going to set these down. I don't need these yet. What is the first measurement I have to get? Leg length or otherwise known as seat height, right? So I need you to sit comfortably with your feet flat on the floor, right? Where am I going to measure from? From the heel, right? Up to... Popliteal fossa, good, right? So I'm gonna come down here and measure up there, right? You guys, you guys gotta stay back there. I don't give my consent. He doesn't give his consent for you guys to observe. Yeah. Too late now. You got the whole world observing you, right? So what if you're not sure about the measurement? What should you do? Measure just from twice. Up. Doesn't hurt, right? So I got 18 for that. I got 18 for that. And I would have one of these sheets with me. Now, could you fill a nice one? Because I'll find what happens as you guys go through this, you're going to have scribbles everywhere. You don't want to turn the scribbly one in, right? But having one of these that you scribble all over, then you take your scribbles and you go to a fresh one and do what? Make it nice and neat, right? So I got 18 for that. Now what else do I need to get? Seat depth, right? What does seat depth go from? Most posterior aspect to the popliteal fossa. That's why I like to have these rulers. Because what I can do with one of these, see, I can take this ruler and I can set it against the back of his kind of buttocks there, right? And now, you can, and you can even lay it down if you want. I just want to kind of against the most posterior aspect. And now I have somewhere to measure to, right? So then I can go... From his popliteal fossa, back to that. So I got 20. I'm going to write down 20 on that. Right? So 20. Then what do I have to get? I got seat depth. I got seat height. I got to get seat width. width. Again, that's where these come in handy because I can take them. And he's, are you sitting fairly relaxed there? Yeah. Yeah. And I can lay one on either side of him. By laying one on either side of him, now I can just come to the back and do what? Measure. Measure between them, right? So his depth is about 17, or his width is 17. Skinny. Well, I mean, that's not the smallest, just to let you know. Okay. You want to try to, so it may be slightly. That's why when I was back here, I kind of made sure they were kind of straight as possible. Is it going to be slightly? Probably, but not enough to affect the measurement. If, if they're like this, yes. Right? That's why when I came on here, I tried to make them as parallel as possible. Now, if you, if you want to, you want to always err on the side of like the wider side, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I use the rulers. Because if I just come back here and measure his buttocks, I could be off by an inch or two. Right? This gives me out to his thighs as well, right? Because he's been doing leg day all day and his legs are swollen. All right, so I guess that's why I like using the rulers. I could just use just the tape measure, right? But I, this is a little bit more accurate. Mm -hmm. Then I need to get seat height. How do I get that? Same thing. Seating surface, the axilla, right? So now if your patient can hold their arm out like this, have them hold their arm out like this, because that gives you a nice area to, for the fold, right? If not, you just have to kind of estimate it, right? So he can do it. Look at it. He's doing a good zombie motion here. So I'm going to come from the surface up to right where I can tickle him. 17 and a half. Right? Okay, 17 and a half. 
So oh, who's got a question? Yes. Um, so most people slouch when they're sitting without a service on the back. Yeah, you want to try to get them to sit as high as possible, right? Bad. He was doing okay. He's got a little bad posture, but he's okay, right? But what else could I do? I could have I could take this table and set one of it end up, right? And give him something to lean back against, right? And again, if I've got a patient that is completely kind of all over the place, while I'm doing these measurements, guess what I have to do? I have to stabilize and guard this patient, right? So I might be back here with my leg against his back while I'm measuring, right? Have a hold of the gait belt and have to do one-handed tape measure measurements. It happens, right? It's one of the other advantage of these is let's say he is kind of unstable. I can guard him with this hand and I can put them under the, the actual uh, rulers to kind of give me a guide to go off of, right? Again, is it going to be exact science? No, but we're going to get as close to exact science as we can. Now we need to get arm rest height. Where does that go from? There you go. From 90 degree elbow bend, from the ole cranon, right? Down to the seating surface. So we got eight there, right? And again, if we're doing custom wheelchair, we do all those middle measurements too. So I got the general measurements. Now I need to get his, what's your approximate height? Five, six. Five seven, okay. And what's your approximate weight? One eighty. One eighty, fantastic. If that's a lot, then I'm in trouble. No, it's, it's, oh, that's a lie. What's that? But think one eighty. We'll go with one eighty. It's not going to make that much of a difference there. <laughs> now, have I gotten pretty much all the measurements I need? Yeah, pretty much all the measurements I got are out of the way, right? If I'm working with the kid, that is when I get rid of these rulers. And move them as far away as possible. Why? Lightsabers. Yes, they will become lightsabers. Right? Because I got news for you. Like, all of us have wrapped presents at Christmas. When you get to the end of the wrapping paper, doesn't matter if you're an adult or a kid, that tube becomes a lightsaber. Admit it. Right? Same thing with these. You'll be sitting there telling them about the wheelchair, and the next thing you know, you're being knighted. Right? So then I have to describe the wheelchair. Right? So that's what I'm going to bring over. Now, this is not your wheelchair but it is one similar to the one you're gonna be getting, right? So first of all, I have to talk about the seating surfaces. So this is gonna be the backrest. This is where your back is going to go. This is the seating surface. This is where your bottom is going to go. This wheelchair collapses and the way it collapses is by grabbing a hold of the seating surface and pulling up, right? To open it up on the sides of the seating surface and push out. These are removable desk rests cut out armrest. I can pop them off by pushing in on that, get them out of my way, or I can put it back in and put them back. And when you guys bent this one already, what else do I have to show? The locks. Brakes, right? These are what type of brakes? Oh. Toggle brakes. They toggle on and off. Push forward to lock, pull back to unlock. We have two wheels. Our front wheels are our caster wheels. They allow you to move around in circles and do different motions. These are your drive wheel. On the drive wheels are your, what is it called? Hand rim projections. That is what you're gonna push the wheelchair with. These are your leg rests. They're extendable and removable. And this is how you take them on, how you put them off, take them off, right? Um, these are your caregiver projections, allow them to push you around. Back on the back here, as you can see, are those two little projections on there, those are the anti-tippers. They're designed to help keep you from falling backwards and also so that somebody can tip the wheelchair if they need to help you get over curbs or that. The wheelchair itself has a couple maintenance points that you need to be aware of. The wheels should be at least lubricated once every month. And then on the bottom here, the cross member where the collapsing part happens, that should be lubricated about as much. Standard WD-40 is enough, if not bacon grease. You're joking, don't use bacon grease. At least it'll make your wheelchair smell better, right? Is there anything else I should need to cover? What do you guys think? Good, there we go. So then I need to go, okay. So then you're gonna sit in the wheelchair. And again, remember your patient, when we put them in the wheelchair is gonna win Guardian Leviosa over to it. You don't have to transfer them, right? You're gonna be like, okay, after I've shown them how to do it, whoop, over they go. We're gonna pretend that it's functional, you transfer them. <laughs> so what, wait, what I have to show them about movement? In order to go forward, Right, so in order to go forward, what's the instructions for going forward? Put both hands evenly on the wheels and push forward. In order to go backwards, 
hands on the wheels and pull backwards. In order to make a right turn, right? Good. So we'll remember to make a left turn, we're going to lock the right wheel and push with that left. To make a left turn, you the other lock with this hand. To make a quick turn, you're going to push and pull at the same time. Right? Sometimes you need to get up and over a small projection, such as a door threshold or something like that. In order to do that, you may need to do like pop up. Yes, you will practice that with your person. And the way to do that is you take a little bit of force and you give yourself a little bit of a pop, right? That'll allow you to kind of hop over projections and allow you to get everything. Um, to go in and out of a door, you're going to approach the door as square as you possibly can, depending upon the patient, right? We may have to change those. You're going to reach for the door and allow the door to push open as far as you can. Go through the door evenly. Make sure that you're lined up so your hands don't get banged against the walls or get against the door. If you're having difficulty, please ask for help. Somebody will help you if you ask for it. Going up and down curves, again, you may need help with that. Also going up and down a ramp. If you're going down a ramp, the important part about going down a ramp is being slow and controlled. Right, so you have to control the wheels going down. You can slightly apply the brakes, provide a little bit of friction, so you slow down going down. To go back up the ramp, you're going to have to build momentum. So you need to start a little bit back of the ramp and push and maybe slightly lean forward. Again, depending upon if they have precautions, we may not be able to lean forward. Right, and then we say to them, him what? Do you understand, right? He says, yes, I understand. Yes, yes. He's being cantankerous patient. Have I checked your meds lately? All right? If he understands, then I'm going to lock the wheelchair, right? And that's when we're going to switch places. And then he's going to get in the wheelchair. So I'm going to have you come over and get in the wheelchair. You magically transport, right? And then I'm going to have him demonstrate, please unlock the wheelchair and then lock the wheelchair again for me. Good. So you understand how to do that. Go ahead and unlock it again. I want you to go forward for me. Good, please go backwards for me. Good, make a right turn for me. I love it. Then make a left turn. Good, right? And then we would take him back and we would show him how to go in and out of the door. We're not gonna go out to the curb until we get approval to go out to the curb. At this point, we're not gonna do the curb, right? So you will have to take him back here and show him how to go out in and out of the door, right? Again, you're not gonna be able to wheel yourself back there and demonstrate it or sit in his lap, right? That means you've got to demonstrate that part on the fly, don't you? To have him go back there. It's also a great time to have him push himself all the way back there because that is considered wheelchair mobilization. And could I document that? Yeah, right? And that I also document his assist levels. Maybe he got halfway back and got tired and I had to help him. And right? I might have to give him in max assist for that, right? Hopefully not max because then I don't know what he's doing in the wheelchair. <laughs> Baby pushes is all he's doing, right? But that gives, so if I was going to the back of the room, how far would you estimate he mobilized the wheelchair? Let's say you're up here. How would you know? Count, right? So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 10, 11, 12. We'll say 13 back and then one, two, 13, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight across, eight, nine across. So 13 times plus eight, nine. So say, let's just say we've got 25, make it easy, right? 25 times two is 50 feet. So we mobilize the wheelchair 50 feet back, right? Now, if he comes back forward after we're done, that means he did 50 feet times two because he did take a break while we're going over the door. Did he go in and out the door? You document that, right? Once you've documented the door, showed him how to do the door, then we're going to come back up here and you're going to ask him if he has any Pain. pain, any questions, anything like that, you're going to finish out the treatment. I forgot to ask pain at the beginning. You want to get pain at the beginning and end. I didn't miss that. Right? But again, if I forgot to get pain at the beginning, what could I do? Yeah. At the end, be like, you know what? I totally forgot to ask you, how did your pain feel at the beginning of the treatment? Can you describe it to me? Can you show me where it's at? And then now after we've done this little bit of mobility, how does it feel? It happens. I've done it where I've completely forgotten the pain until I get to the very end. You just get what you get. Right? Could I also see his fatigue level after this? How would I ask that? On a scale of zero to 10, after doing this today, how tired do you feel, right? That might be important for somebody that's got, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or MS or something like that to see how he does just moving the wheelchair that little bit. 
And then you're going to finish it out. And then you're going to take all the stuff you have and you're going to create a what? Soap note, right? All right, you can go back to your seat then. Yes. We're good. Thank you for being the patient. So for the soap note, right? First of all, you're going to have one of these to turn in, right? One of the sheets. So if I was a person that I was working on these, I'd grab two. One that you can kind of scribble on and then one that you're going to turn in as the official patient record. If this is in the hospital, right, and they don't have an electronic chart for this, what would you have to put on this piece of paper? Not a cover page. You'd have to, okay, so it has to be HIPAA compliant, right? So if I'm in the hospital, it has to be face down so no one can look at it, right? But it should also have a patient sticker on it, indicating that it's with them, because that sticker is going to have what on it? The barcode, the their, their uh, what do you call it? Their, I want to, MRN, there we go. I was going to call it their uh, MRA number. That's different, right? It's going to have their record number so they can put it in document, right? Now, if they do do electronic, do do, if they do do electronic documentation, more than likely, this is going to have to get out of the therapy department and get scanned, right? Because that's just the way it is. These all have to be electronic nowadays, right? But if not, it may just get put into their chart if they still have, there are some clinics still in town that have paper charts, and I don't know why. Because, right? So I've got this. Do I have to put all these measurements on my soap note? No, I could, right? But I could just say, see wheelchair measurement chart for activity for measurements, right? Or see flow sheet for wheelchair measurements, something to that effect, right? So you can do that. What? That would be an objective because it's measurements, right? So in my subjective, I would put that he agreed to treatment. Did he have any pain pre post treatment? Um, what was he like? Did he just take his pain meds? He indicated, I just took my pain meds two hours ago. I would indicate that patient reports taking pain meds two hours, anything he tells us, right? Um, I always put consent in there because that way if the patient says, well, I didn't agree to this, right? You indicated that you asked them consent. Now, is that going to be hundred percent legally binding? I don't know, but at least protects you, right? And then objective, well, I want to have C flow sheet for measurements. Right. What else do I want an objective? How far he traveled, right? You know, I could put that demonstrated wheelchair components and wheelchair mobility to patient, then transferred patient to wheelchair, wheel patient mobilized wheelchair 50 feet times two with minimal assist for, I don't know, whatever, turning maybe, maybe he's having problem turning. Right. So I've got the, how he did it. Then I'm going to indicate how he did with what? going in and out of the door, right? Patient able to open and go through a door both ways, because you're gonna have them come in and go out, right? With whatever assistance level, that makes sense so far. And then you would also, in the real world, you'd also put what their transfer assistance level was to get them into the wheelchair, right? You know, you would say they were a mod assist, slide board, you know, min assist, stand pivot transfer, whatever it is, you'd wanna put that in there as well. Um, I'm not going to dock you if you don't have that in this because we're not actually physically transferring, but it might be a good idea to get in the habit of doing that, right? Just make it up. Your pay, yeah. So here it says like transfer board. Yep. Do I show my patient transfer board? You don't have to show them for this, but it would be indicated that's how you put that down in your soap note. Yeah, the demonstrated transfer board slide, whatever, slide board transfer to patients, right? You're not going to, we're not going to, this is not the transfer stop. We already did that, right? Um, so anything else that you can think of that would be an objective? Well, what if you did any exercise? Well, that would be in there in the real world, right? Here, we're not going to do any exercises, right? So we got basically all of the objective stuff we need, got everything we did. Now we got to take what we did and turn it into something we saw, right? So we got the assessment portion of it. The assessment we're going to put in, what did we see happen? What did the patient have the most difficulty with, Right. You know, did they have more difficulty going in the door than out the door, right? Because maybe it is. Maybe going from the floor in here to carpet was more difficult, right? That assessment, again, the main goal of the assessment is to put anything that you saw happen. Did their pain increase or decrease? Did they need additional assistance today going from the wheelchair to the bed or to the chair to the wheelchair, right? That assessment then drives our what? Plan, right? Because let's say he had trouble mobilizing the wheelchair. Maybe it was a mod assist for turning. Then in the plan, I can say, 
continue working on mobilizing the wheelchair, focusing on turning skills next session, right? What if I notice he has problems propelling it? Could I add exercises that would strengthen him propelling it? Yeah, right? I did forget one other thing you have to talk to the patient about when they're in the wheelchairs. One other thing I totally forgot. Talk about pressure relief, right? So how often should they relieve pressure when they're sitting in this wheelchair? Every two hours is minimal, right? So how do I relieve pressure if I'm sitting in the wheelchair? If I'm, okay, right. I at least need to kind of weight shift, right? Ideally, if I can do a wheelchair press up, do that, right? That would be objective if you demonstrated it, yeah, right? But you definitely want to cover that because the last thing you want to do is the patient develop a pressure injury on his ischial tuberosities and you're like, well, I told him about pressure relief. What's the patient say? No, -uh. right? Do you want to talk about pressure relief? You may have to, again, depending upon the patient, you may have to order a cushion, right? And a lot of patients hate to say it. If I've got a patient that's going to be long-term in the wheelchair, I order a pressure relief cushion, right? And now if that pressure relief cushion is two inches high, am I going to have to adjust my measurements? Yeah, right? So I may have to think about that in the real world. Right, and may indicate in the actual soap note what type of pressure cushion I'm going to relieve. Right, most of them you're going to see in the real world are Rojos, because Rojo makes almost all of the pressure relief cushions that are out there. And then you determine what they are. Are they a gel filled pressure relief cushion? Like I've got a gel filled one on my chair in there, or are they air filled? Are they an air bladder pressure relief? What are they made of? Is it a hard pressure relieving one? Right, maybe it's molded specifically to his bottom, and it's what do you call it, memory foam. There are all kinds. Maybe they, you get one of the purple ones. Those are just weird. Any of you ever say, seen those? They actually make, you know who purple is? The company that makes the purple mattresses. They make pressure relieving cushions. They're weird. I've sat in a couple of them. So it's the same, same material they make the pillows and the beds out of. And it does work well. And it just, it, it, it's a different sensation you're sitting on. That's for sure. Right? But the only problem that I found with those purple cushions is they break down really quick. The pillows, the beds, not so much, but those cushions, like patients will go through one a year at least, right? And remember with cushions, guess how many you probably get? Like one. And those things are expensive. A really good Rojo, you're talking five, 600 bucks, right? So they're not cheap. They're also made to be compartmentalized. So if something breaks, you just replace that component of it. Like if the air bladder breaks, you just replace that. Some of them are even that you can put extra foam in them. You take extra foam out. There's all kinds of cool features of the cushions. Um, plan, you can also put, if the, I put in all my notes for my plans, if how many treatments they have till the next evaluation, right? Get in a habit of doing that because the PT, unfortunately, it's not their fault. They're going to be overwhelmed and they're going to miss re-evals, right? Whereas if you know, okay, I've got three visits till the next re-eval. I've got two visits to the next re-eval. I've got one visit till the next re-eval. What should you be doing at that point? Telling the PT or at least telling up front, hey, you know, Susan with the wheelchair scheduled, she needs to be a reval next visit. Can we put them on Dr. Arata's schedule, please? Right? And then they have to find a way to squeeze them into that her schedule. Could they be scheduled on my schedule and Dr. Arata do the reval still? Potentially, right? Because she could have me get all the what? Measurements. She could say, okay, I'll come in and do the reassessment. Do me a favor and get me all, man, muscle testing, goniometry. Give me how the wheelchair is going. I want all that written out for me. And then I'll come in and finalize the re-eval, re right? So she comes in for the last 15 minutes, gets all the glory and we did all the work. I've had that happen lots of times, especially with Oasis is on home health. <laughs> you see, Oasis is a bad word, isn't it? What about health? How about this? Hold on. Fim. What? Fims. <laughs> I, those are bad words yes yep i figured as much <laughs> depends on the state some of the states have both progress notes and re-evals right usually a progress note's going where well what are we what are we usually writing a progress note? who who are we writing that for position yeah right <laughs> Progress note is typically the PT's note that gets sent over to the physician. 
Could the re-eval be a progress note? Maybe in your clinic, right? It just depends upon what happens. And maybe that's what they consider a progress note. But a true progress note is just basically, here's how the patient looks right now, and we may need more visits, right? That's kind of the way I've always viewed a progress note. It's not a hard, it's not as hard as a re-eval. So re-eval, they've got to go back and do all of their measurements over again. Whereas a progress note, she may just come in and go, so how do you think you're doing in therapy? Oh, I'm doing okay. I'm a little having trouble with balance in this. Okay, I'm going to send a note over to your doc. And that's kind of what the progress note is. And it's just basically like a, a soap note that goes to the doctor, right? Yeah. That would be that would be a total eval. It wouldn't be a re-eval, oh. right? That could be, a, that would be a secondary eval, right? But let's say that, again, we're in the hospital and the patient goes from... I don't know, the general med floor down to the ICU. Now that's a re-eval, right? Because they've now gotten worse and they, they got to go see the PT, right? Um, or in, in the case, you know, where it's been so many visits, right? And that those are changing. So I don't want to totally talk about that right now. We'll talk about that in billing because there's going to be some changes to how many visits it takes until you have to do a re-eval, right? But there's hard, each state has different rules. But if the patient is under Medicare, whose rules do we follow? Medicare is unless the states are more stringent. Right, just be aware of that Medicare is kind of is your universal whatever I do. They say we do it, right? So if Medicare says every five visits and your state says seven, it's every five if that patient's a Medicare, right? If the state says five and Medicare says seven, it's five. It's whichever one is the most kind of tight, right? You would think that we just have one universal. This is how many revals, but why do we have to have those notes about when we have to do revals? Let's face it, what would happen if we didn't have a rule about reevaluations? They would never get them, right? We would just write soap notes and it would just be, the patient would just be seeing us for nine years and there'd be no, it, it's not, it's not, I'm not saying fraud, right? But what I'm saying is it just, there, if there's no rules there, we won't follow the rules. That's kind of the way it's gotta be, right? Uh, maybe the state says every 30 visits, they have to be a reeval. Good Lord. A lot can happen in 30 visits, right? I would hope my PT would want more than just every 30 visits, right? Because they want to know what's going on with the patient too. Because what if they do a reval and the patient's good needs to be discharged? You get them out the door, right? Any other questions about the general wheelchair comp? So you understand kind of the process, right? Yeah. This is more simple stuff, right? We actually lose every night in the boat. Whenever we have a book, we have a book. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not gonna you're not gonna just chair, but we may put a what type of we might put a pillow back there when they're sitting in it, or what type of back might we put on it? A reclining back. Yeah, we can keep the measurements the same as long as we tilt this back 25 degrees. Good one. Elevating, good. I mean, it depends. If I know that they're kind of sensitive, I may elevate the leg, especially if I know that they're starting to develop a knee contracture. Because even on hip replacements, they'll develop knee contractures, right? Because they're going to put pillows under the leg so it feels better, right? And then you see them and they're like this, right? I like my leg rest to help me with knee, or knee contractures. Because I can put that leg rest up and guess what gravity does? Straightens it right out, right? So that allows for that. I may put an elevating leg rest on a total hip, but again, then I have to make sure that they're not what? not sitting upright, because then here, I'd be breaking it, right? And again, for most of the time, if you're doing it in the clinic, you're just testing it, I would just put at least a pillow back there to keep them from it, right? If you get, especially if you get like one of those lumbar roll pillows, those are really good for total hip replacements that keeps them kind of arched out. You could use foam roll, but it's just what? Kind of foamy and hardy. It doesn't feel very good, right? Now, if you got like, we've got the soft blue ones in the back, you could use one of those. There's like two, two or three soft foam blue rolls, soft rollers, lumbar pillows. But yeah, definitely it, we just have to compensate for it. And again, if they're just going to get an off the brand wheelchair, they're not going to get a custom. We may have to get like a lumbar support pillow or something back there to keep them from going to 90, right? And make sure they understand that. It may be hard for transfers too, right? Because to get out of the chair, right? We have to teach them you have to get out of the chair, keeping the leg down, right? 
So that's going to affect our transfers for sure if they have a posterior hip. Or for, an anterior hip, not so much. Anterior, we're good. That's why I wish we'd do more anteriors. And the only problem with the anterior hips I find is then the surgery site's here and it kind of gets pinched when they're sitting, right? Yep. So in terms of the top, you said you're going to give us a scenario. So like I'm not just going to measure her normally. You're going to measure, yeah, you're going to measure her just the way she is. Okay. Your scenario is just going to help you decide what parts you have to wear in the wheelchair. One arm, maybe one arm drive, maybe a, a tabletop platform, right? Yep. Yeah, for the for this, you're, you're just going to measure her regularly. And then after you write it up, that's when you're going to make the stuff. That's why I'm giving you a scenario so that you have to think a little bit about some accessories. Right? This isn't a think about how she looks if she had a stroke. Right? And plus, I hate to say it, but you guys aren't very good actors yet. We got to work on those acting skills. Right. I mean, some of you did pretty good last semester with the other group, made them cry. Um, but yeah, so we got to kind of work on some of that stuff. So not acting, but that that it's, it's really hard to act like you have a stroke. It's really hard to act like you have an amputation, too. Right now, if I have any speaking, of, if I have an amputation, they actually make an amputee leg rest. So that it kind of elevates and it only keeps whatever is there. Right. There's one for a, a below knee. There's one for an above knee. Because again, the, the bane of all existence for all surgeries is getting stuck in flexion, right? Um, what if I'm worried about them crossing their legs? What could I put? Hello? Yeah, if you got total hip replacement, you're worried about them sitting in a wheelchair like this, you may have to put a small pillow between their knees or get their adductor pillow that they have in their room, put that between their legs, right? Because they make adductor pillows for them. But then they're like this, that's not very comfortable, right? Where, now taking this long term, where, let's think on this, I'm sitting in the wheelchair. Where are you worried about pressure injuries developing? Ischial tuberosities are number ones. Okay, good. Ischial tubes, good. My forearms or the elbows rest. What's that? Greater trochs, good. Scapulas, inferior angulus, scapula. Behind the what? I saw somebody pointing back here. Behind the fossa, in that popliteal fossa, could be if the chair is too deep, right? What about on the heels? Could it also be in the heels? Yeah, if they're in a leg rest and they wear socks or don't put shoes on, right? On those plastic things, they can definitely develop pressure injury. Or with the slings on the back, could he eat into the back of the Achilles tendon, right? So you have to kind of think about all that. Um, could be fine. Okay, yeah, especially if the chair's not soft enough. Right, or there's, you know, it's if they've got a firm back, because sometimes we do order firm backs. If we got somebody that's got kind of negative pressure, we need to put seatbelts on them. That could, yeah, you could get it, especially if they're really bony. Uh, it's not going to happen to me. I've got plenty of meat back there. If they were a gate, if they were a belt, you'd have to check kind of under the belt areas to make sure that you didn't get a breakdown of the belts as well. Yeah, right. So that means you're going to be checking them. And again, if you're sending them home with this, you may have to teach the patient where they need to check. Right. Or tell the family members, hey, these are some areas to be concerned about. Right. What about their palms? Would you might want to check those too? Yeah. Right. From pushing the wheelchair a lot. Right. And also, I hate to say it, from getting these locks, because they just sometimes are pains in the butts. And I've seen patients have their pinkies down like this and lock their pinkies into their wheelchair. It doesn't feel very good. Right. It's a little finger hurt. Yeah. It hurts. Right, so we want to that's why we want to teach them proper technique. Now, if I have my feet on the ground and I'm propelling with my legs, could I get pressure on the lateral aspect of my gastrops? Could I get injuries there? Yeah, from bumping in to all these components in the bottom of the wheelchair. Because uh, guess what, these components down here aren't usually nice and soft where the leg rests attach on. So they may, as they're pushing, right? Because this wheelchair is too narrow for me. I can feel every time I push with my legs, I'm getting digging into those leg rest hooks, right? So it might need to be a little bit, what I'm saying is I need a wider load wheelchair, right? What if you see, you get the perfect fit for the patient, but their arms are too short? You might have to adjust that. We might have to have, they, some of the wheelchairs often have little adjustments that they can bring the wheels up a little bit, right? So that it allows the wheels to be a little bit higher. Now it's gonna drop the seat, right? You may have to compensate for that, but some of them have a little adjustment. Again, when they get the custom wheelchair, there's small fine tuning adjustments they can do, right? There's a little bit they can do on the seat. There's a little bit they can do on the height. There's a little bit they can do on the leg rest, a little bit to do on the back, but guess what? 
if you measure totally wrong, you can't fix it, right? So you got to make sure those measurements are accurate, right? And looking at the sheet as we go down, right, for seat height, right, you're going to add two inches. Why do we add two inches that height? Yeah, clearance of the foot, right? So in the case of Edwin, Edwin was 18. So we add two, that would be 20. Then we go over and look on the side. Is there a 20 size? There is. So that would be what we'd order. Does that make sense? Say 20. Then we go down to seat depth. He was a 20, right? So that's going back. We're going to subtract two inches for that to give clearance of the popliteal fossa, right? So it's 18. We look, is there an 18 size? There is. We pick that. Seat width, he was a 17. We're going to add about an inch and a half. So that's going to go to how much? 18 and a half. We're going to go over here. Is there an 18 and a half? There's, uh, nope, there's no 18 and a half. Right? So if there's a 19, if your wheelchair company orders 19s, you order a 19, but most of them don't. For whatever reason, they don't have 19 inch wheelchairs. I don't know why. Don't ask me. It goes 18. So it goes 17, 18, 20. Or no, I'm sorry. It is even numbers. And it's all even. That's right. Uh, is that back? Oh, no, seat width. The seat width does the same thing, right? Yeah, I don't know. There is a 19 seat width. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so you go 19. It's seat width. The back height thing gets weird. There's no halves in back heights, all even numbers, right? So, yeah, we would order 19. That gives him just a little bit more clearance in case he gains a little bit of junk in his trunk, right? You got to protect for that. Back height, he was 17 and a half. We're going to subtract four inches to give clearance for those inferior angles of the scapula. So, he's going to go down to the 13 and a half. The smallest size we have is 14 on here. So guess what? That's what we order, right? And then armrest height, we just measure whatever it is, and that's what we report. That'll be how high the armrests are. Then we get order all the parts from there, right? So he's 5'7". We're going to order a normal adult wheelchair, right? Um, his weight, he's 180. Would you order a 200 or a 225? Depends. Right, estimate what the patient's going to be. Right, if you know if you, you know the patient's fairly healthy, active, I'd probably go with the two hundred. But if you're like, I uh, already got some extra weight getting put on, stuff like that, we might order two twenty five because again, they're going to gain between twenty and twenty five pounds in the wheelchair. Right, and so if he goes twenty five pounds, now he's at two hundred five, he's over the two hundred pound weight limit. Right, so you kind of have to err on the side of what you think the patient will do there. Right, we talked about the different leg rests, how they're going to push it, all that. You're going to order that separately. Does that generally make sense? Right, and that's all there is to the wheelchair pump. It's just doing that, and then you're going to go home, write a soap note, and turn it into me. Right, and I'm going to give you individualized feedback on your soap notes. I'm going to be writing up those soap notes so that you see what you did right, what you did wrong, kind of what you're looking at. Right, even for the goniometry and the main and must testing, I'm. It takes a little bit because I have to go through. 23 of you soap notes times 50,000 comps. But I want you guys to have individual feedback so that when you go to the clinic, you can have some. And sometimes I even go get Dr. Reskin or Dr. Arada for some of those. I'm like, what do you think about this in a soap note? Because I'm going, eh, I don't know about this, right? And that way I can get some other opinions because I know I'm pretty, I am pretty rigid on soap notes. For you guys to get it, I make them work 25 points. If you get a 25 out of 25 of my soap note, you're better than most people. It's pretty rare for me to give 25 out of 25 on a soap note because I don't think my notes are 25 out of 25, right? I think I can improve them. Every time I do a type of a soap note, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot that. Oh yeah, I forgot that, right? So don't be shocked if you don't get a perfect is all I'm saying. It's going to be hard to get a perfect. You're going to have to nail everything on it. Now, by the end of the semester, you might get closer to perfect or maybe even a perfect, but the first one, no, you ain't getting a perfect. Just accept that. Sorry. Sorry, you guys that are going to be my first guinea pigs with my soap notes. That was going to turn in. He's like, not anymore. Right. But again, it's not, it's a way of me showing you love. That's all it is and affecting your grade. But it's showing you love. Right. It's main idea so that when you go out in the clinic, you don't get the same kind of feedback. Right. And in the clinic, they could be like, why did Mr. McKeever tell you to do this? This is stupid. We don't do that in our clinic. Okay. Do what you do in the clinic. Right. And again, remember, one of the things I have to teach you guys when you guys go out and do clinics, clinics are one world. The boards are a totally different world. You will, when you go to sit for your boards, have to completely separate your brain from the clinic brain to just the book brain. Right. Because I already talked about some anti-must testing where we do in different positions. The book says, nope, this is the only position. 
okay, you gotta know that kind of stuff, right? For wheelchairs, all this is kind of cut and dry, right? You might get questions on this where it says patient width is this wide. What how size? What would you order? And you have to know the pluses or the minuses. Yes, you have to know those. Any other questions on the wheelchair comp? Okay, I'm gonna stop recording. Bye bye to everyone I'm recording for. <laughs>